Welcome back to the bluegrass on this super hot August day. <laughs> oh man, it is so hot that uh, these dogs are pretty wore out and uh, one of my clients ended up uh, deciding it was a little too hot to make it out. So we got a few minutes and I thought this would be a perfect chance to uh, answer a question that we get all the time. Uh, you know, now everybody watches my videos and they see me, you know, here at my kennel environment, they also see us down at the river or the lake or uptown doing stuff. And we just are constantly bombarded with the same question, which is, hey, Stoney, how do I get my dog to be trustworthy in a high distraction environment? Okay. And I know that's, I mean, why do you go to training class, right? You go to training class so that you can get your dog to, you know, come be still and have good manners uh, because it's easy to take a dog that'll come be still and have good manners out into public and in public is where you live your life, right? At the soccer games, at the barbecues, at the, at the pubs where you drink a beer and sit with your dog, whatever it is that you like to do. <sighs> That's why you need obedience training, guys. You know, you, you know, I just simply look at my job as removing the impediments that stand in the way of being able to, you know, completely integrate a dog into your life. Right? So I, my, my overarching goal with this whole YouTube channel is to get out, get people moving, help them lead more interesting lives, and improve the relationship between them and their dogs. Right? And I want it to be a 360 degree win. I want people to be happy, I want the dogs to be happy, and then I want the people out in the real world that the dogs come in contact with to be happy also. Right? So that's what we're after, a 360 degree win. So how do we get there? How do we get from training work or formal dog training at dog training class or at a kennel like mine to real life training? Okay, It's really simple. And uh, that's another thing I try to really make sure people understand in, in on my dog training channel is that dog training is simple. It doesn't mean that it's easy, right? but it is simple. The methodology, you know people argue all the time about the method. I'm not interested in the methodology. I've seen lots of dogs that, that, that like have been trained lots of ways. What I'm interested in is are people able to choose a method that's uh, easy, easy to implement in their daily lives. In other words, it's simple. Not, not easy, but simple to do. And that's what I'm going to talk to you right now about is something, a simple way to look at how to get ready to go out into the real world. So there's three components to it from my perspective. The first, genetics. You know, like if you're in the dog business, you just can't uh, escape uh, you know, the genetic trap. Uh, and what I mean by that is you just have to accept and embrace the fact that behavior is determined by genetics, right? So dogs have what's called a physical conformation. In other words, they look a certain way, like a Malinois looks like a Malinois. A Labrador looks like an Airedale looks like an Airedale. Along with that physical conformation goes a behavioral conformation. So you have to understand that, okay? Now, once you understand the genetics play a large role in how your training is going to help you manage your dog, now it's time to move on to the second thing, which is education, right? So you have to take your dog, understand who it is, understand what approach at training is going to probably be successful with that type of dog, given their behavioral conformation. Then you move on to education. And that's when you set out and you formulate a plan. What do I need a dog to do? And how am I going to go about explaining to him that I would like for him to do that in the widest possible uh, environmental circumstances? Okay. So we have genetics, we have education, and then we have proper management. Now, uh, proper management is front-loaded. Okay, and what I mean by that is, like, uh, as you're educating your dog and you gradually are able to explain to him what you like, and you're gradually able to build a motivational base, okay, there's, like, over here is a dog that's really, really reliable in a high distraction environment. Over here is a puppy that doesn't know anything about high distraction environments. Well, at, at, when you first get a puppy, it's all management. This whole area is just management. Then as the puppy starts to understand what's expected, right, get a little bit more real life experience, that puppy starts to self-manage. So our ultimate goal with a dog is to get them to the point to where they can make good decisions on their own, right? what I call autonomous behavior selection. And instead of there being this big amount of time where you have to manage their behavior, it's only a small amount of time where you have to manage their behavior, right? And so like, what's a management technique? Like what environments do you take the dog into? What do you allow to come into your dog's environment? Do you have them on a leash? If you have them on a leash, is it a short leash or a long leash? Those are the kinds of things that you have to think about. So genetics, education, and management. Now let's flesh that out a little bit while I walk some dogs. Let's take a look at a few different dogs and see how our, you know, our overarching principles apply to each dog. Come on, Rupert. Now, so here's Rupert. Now, what Rupert is, is an Airedale Terrier. And uh, you'll kind of have to bear with Rupert here if you hear him t panting a little bit, because like I said, it's August and we've been running around all morning. Uh, uh, but when you have an Airedale, you have to remember what they call Airedales, which is the king of all terriers. So people, 
Come on, Rupert, up, up. So people take a look at these dogs. Wait, let me get them over here where you can see them a little better. People take a look at these dogs and uh, they look kind of like giant teddy bears. And so people have a tendency to think of them as giant teddy bears, right? And usually if we see an Airedale, it's because somebody has made a mistake of thinking as this, the king of all terriers, the most versatile of all the, the uh, hunting terriers, right? Uh, is a teddy bear because they're not a teddy bear, right? They're a big hunting dog and uh, they're good at a lot of things. They're good at hunting. They're good at uh, being uh, family protection dogs. Uh, they're just general purpose hang out and be good in different types of weather, okay? Teddy Roosevelt had a quote about Airedales. I'll have to paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact quote, but something along the lines of uh, an Airedale can do anything that any other dog can do uh, and then when they're done, they can whoop the other dog, right? <laughs> and that's kind of true, you know? So uh, this guy comes out here. Come on, up, up, up. Oh, get up here. This guy comes out here and he's hanging out. And uh, man, look at him. He just, like I said, he looks like a big teddy bear. But he's the farthest thing from a teddy bear, guys. He is a big, tough dog. And when you take him out, like when we take him out in the field and stuff, if he sees a rabbit, if he sees a squirrel, man, he's, uh, you know, it's really hard to control him because he has a natural tendency to go get those things, to hunt them up, right? Now, another thing where we run into problems with uh, Airedales is uh, they do not take to being trifled with, okay? They're a big, powerful dog, and they know it. And so if you take them out and another dog bows up on them, hey, they're going to stand their ground. And uh, let's just be honest, they're not always just going to stand their ground. They're going to take ground, okay? So, like, if you're going to take this Airedale out in public in a high-distraction environment, then you need to keep in mind he's a big, tough dog with a low threshold at which he gets uh, excited and wants to chase and, 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 and kill things, right? Because he's a big hunting dog. Uh, but also, he's not a dog that backs down from conflict. So you have to be a little bit more careful, right? And you have to use a little bit more management. So remember, we said genetics, education, management. Uh, so genetics, I, I know what kind of dog Rupert is. So like, uh, as I'm doing my training protocol, I keep that in mind. Education, I'm trying to teach him that I want him to come, be still, and have good manners from a neighbor's perspective. But he has got his own mind about what good manners are. And so management, with, with management techniques with Rupert, I had to be more careful because he is a big, strong terrier. Okay, let's look at somebody else. Okay, now we have Bricks, which is an awesome English Springer Spaniel. And this is one of my favorite dogs, guys. Come on, Bricks, let's go. Uh, these little dogs here, uh, <coughs> they were bred to be close-up hunting dogs, what they call flushing dogs. And uh, we call them zigzaggers. Like when we're back there in the field, what they do, and from the, top of, from the time they're just little bitty babies, you know, we don't teach them, they just do it. They just kind of get out in front of you and they zigzag like that. Or people call it quartering, up, up, up. And uh, they, I mean, they are awesome. These dogs are about the perfect size to throw up in a truck. They're good little hunting dogs for upland game. They stay close. They never get in fights with other dogs. They're, they're beautiful. I mean, look at that dog, Eli. Is that not just a beautiful dog? Oh, hey, talking about a hit. You take this little dog here. We took her, oh, we took her uptown to a ball game the other day. And I mean, you couldn't have put more love on a dog. There wasn't, there wasn't any more room to put any more love on her. She got so much love. Oh, but sometimes she misses up. There you go. Now, so like see right there where she messed up a little bit on that jump and I just kind of used my body to block her off and I used my leash, I just pulled a little bit and she, you know, she just kind of said, okay, Stoney, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mess up and she hopped back up over that barrel. That's about the level of fussing it ever takes to train these little dogs. I mean, they're just about perfect. I could train a hundred of them at a time if they came here. Uh, I mean, I just don't have anything bad to say about them, you know. Now, it's kind of hot right now and she's a little bit young so she might be showing a little bit of fatigue but I just I, I, like I said I can't say enough so let's talk about genetics education and management okay genetics I have a dog she's bred to stay close to me so getting her to stay close and not run off very far uh, as a dog trainer that's that's already done for me it's encoded in the genetics uh, being able to get along with other dogs again it's, it's encoded for me it's in the genetics these dogs are not prone to conflict with other dogs look how sweet she looks Okay, now, so like these dogs get plenty of attention when they go out. They're bred to have a very soft mouth. So they generally don't bite on your hands and stuff very much, you know. So the management, think about that. Genetics, training, and management. Her genetics is already given me a dog that's uh, very sociable, very outgoing, very friendly, very lovable, with a soft mouth that doesn't run off very far. 
So that takes the education part and it reduces it quite a bit. And, and if you think in terms of managing the dog, well, like if this is how much I have to manage a dog in, in, in theory, right? If the dog self manages and they don't run off, they're really nice with kids and stuff. They really got a nice laid back temper, they, temperament. They have a soft mouth, right? They like to stay close. Look, you see how that just the genetics of it is squeezing down my responsibilities as a dog trainer to just a little bitty teeny slice. Right? That's why these dogs, I can just get them in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, so quick. I mean, it's a, they're just awesome. How many could we do, Eli? A hundred of them. hundred. hundred easy. Right? Okay, let's look at somebody okay, else. Okay, now we have another kind of bird dog. Now, this one's only 12 weeks old, guys. And so, uh, you know, bear with it. Like I said, it's 90-something degrees. All right, so this is a German short hair pointer. And so this is a bird dog, and Bricks is a bird dog. <laughs> but... <laughs> Listen, they couldn't be farther apart in terms of what it's like to live with them. Okay, come on, little dog. These little German short hair pointers, they're a real hardy, high endurance, high energy output uh, hunting machine, you know? Like, and so, like, when we go out back and we've got one of those, uh, like, say, an English Cocker or an English Springer, which are very similar little dogs. Like, you know, they just kind of like they rub, they wag their little tail and they zigzag in front of you and you don't even have to pay attention to them. We can be out there sawing limbs or, you know, setting up a bonfire for, you know, clients tonight or whatever it is that we're doing. And we can have them little, little spaniels just running around doing their own thing. You know, we never even pay attention to them. These guys here, they're into something at all times. I mean, they are literally into something at all times, right? And uh, like you build a fire, they get into fire. You, you stack up some firewood, they get on top of the firewood. Uh, <laughs> sometimes these little guys, like this one's only 12 weeks old, they have no fear. So like we have a big creek out back and the other day we hear this little dog kind of squalling and uh, me and Eli's trying to work on something and the dog had bailed off the creek bank right right into a big hole like where the water kind of swirls and it couldn't get out but anybody with any sense like if a dog had any like self-preservation qualities about it would have never this this bank is this high back there dog just bailed right off of it it's com I mean, just completely crazy okay so come on come on so when we're working with a dog like this and we want to take them into a real life environment let's let's look at our three things come on help oh you need a little help you can do it. Come on. A little extra motivation in this heat. That dog crack, guys. That's about the only thing that gets them fired up when it's hot. <laughs> but let's talk about our three things, right? Genetics. What's this dog? It's a hunting dog that's bred to kind of go away from you. So the whole time that you're training it, like people think they're hard-headed because they don't like look at their handler much. That's not what they're bred to do. You wouldn't want a bird dog that like sits there and looks at you. Hey, go find us some birds. No, the bird dog's supposed to go find the birds, right? So a dog's genetic tendency is to go, to move, to move. And then these dogs are bred to have super high endurance, so they don't just move, they move and move and move. And they never stop, do they, Eli? Never. Never stop. Never. I mean, you know, you gotta get a four-wheeler to keep up with them, even when they're babies. Uh, <clears throat> so let's look at our thing. We got genetics. So what's the genetics tendency of this dog? They're, they're awesome, they're fun to be around, uh, but they're always doing something, right? So if this is how much I've gotta manage them, they're not gonna, they're not gonna like take on a lot of that management uh, like just naturally, like say that little Springer's going to, right? So then I got to do a lot more educating. I got to teach the dog, hey, listen, running off and doing stuff, it's great, it's awesome, right? But you can't just be running off all the time. You got to stay close to us. And while you're close to us, you have to be calm, attentive, and polite, right? And so like the genetics, like here's what I need to, to, to have to go out in the public. The genetics are only taking care of this much of that, calm, attentive, and polite behavior. So that I got to educate to be calm, attentive, and polite, right? Where I can just kind of expect it out of that English uh, Springer. Uh, or an English cocker, uh, and then over here, like obviously the dog, this dog is, is it's only 12 weeks old, right? So I haven't had time to do much in the way of education, right? And, and education, even if you education, educate them, remember, like you can educate a puppy, but then you still got to deal with the mid-pubescent dog, and that's when they go crazy. They hit puberty, and then bam, they spike up during that mid-pubescent phase, and they're tough. So if you have this type of dog, that first year or two, like out of this, this combination of how you get them to go out, which is uh, genetics, uh, education, and management, the genetics only cover a little bit of the ground. So you're stuck doing a lot of education, right, and a lot of patient and persistent management. Okay, let's look at a different dog. Okay guys, now you're gonna get to see the dog that gets more attention than any dog we've ever had out here probably. <laughs> this is Nash. He's a bull mastiff. Get down here and look at Nash's face, Eli. <laughs> if you don't think that dog's going to get some attention when you go out, you're crazy, you know. So, like with this kind of dog, look, they loved, they loved to, 
they love attention. People love to give them attention, so it's fun to take them out. But taking them out is problematic because... <laughs> <laughs> let me well let me try to walk him so you can see all right taking them out is problematic because they get so tired this puppy here is 17 weeks old they get giant and watch him watch him do stuff good boy you're a very good dog they get so tired when they go out that sometimes you'll take them out and uh, they'll just decide that they're too tired to keep walking and then they just you know they just don't <laughs> and there's no picking them up and carrying them there's no dragging them you know so you have to do a whole lot of work with them come on come on baby to get them to the point where you can even take them out now another thing with these guys <laughs> look at his tail you guys i mean his tongue you remember how i talk about the tongue it's a fatigue meter <laughs> Well, this dog's only done about five things all day, so we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have to shortcut the whole course and just hit the highlights. Right here, he comes up these steps. That's pretty awesome, all right? Guys, do not let people convince you that your dog should not learn how to do steps when they're young. Like this guy, he's not gonna be coordinated when he's older, and so you're gonna wait until he's a full-grown dog to teach him to do steps. Uh, that'd be like you like trying to learn uh, how to do ballet when you're 50. That's crazy. Come on. So we get him to come over here. Now, when uh, this dog was bred, which is funny, because when this dog was bred, uh, it was called a gamekeeper's night dog. And so, you know, like um, these people that were tasked with uh, protecting the game, kind of game wardens for these big, rich estates, they bred a dog to be like big and agile and powerful and uh, kind of scary so that they could, you know, kind of keep poachers and stuff. Uh, uh, off of uh, off of the manors and off of the estates and then if like somebody did get caught poaching this dog could kind of go get them you know <laughs> look at him Eli <laughs> who's that dog chasing <laughs> right and theoretically now this is the this is what they tell you that these dogs supposedly would like uh, go jump on people and kind of hold them until they could uh, be the hold the poachers until they could be apprehended uh, now I don't know <laughs> how much of that's true but just to be honest with you I have a tendency to think uh, that not much of it's true I don't know because if these dogs originally had a lot of endurance a lot of speed and athleticism I don't know where it went okay but I do know what we have now is we have the most awesome looking dog in the whole world <laughs> they just get so much attention everywhere we go so let's take it let's get him up here and talk about our three things now he there's no way he can get up here by himself so I'm gonna put him up here all right so we got our three things, right? To be able to take this dog out in public uh, and, and get him to be calm, attentive, and polite, like it's a combination of genetic tendencies and education and improper management. Okay, so genetic tendencies. This guy's super chill. I mean, he, like, so uh, if I need him to be good, like as a dog trainer, just his genetics is gonna do most of that. I just gotta kinda worry about him pulling on leash, jumping up, doing stuff like that. He ain't running off. He's not being rude. He's not starting dog fights. He's just a cool, chill dude, right? So out of all that stuff I have to do, genetics handles a big part of it. The education is kind of tough on these guys because they're not bred, uh, not tough on them, but tough with them because they're not bred to do a job in conjunction with a handler. So like when I come out here and I say it's time to learn, he just kind of looks at me like time to learn what do I know what I need to know. And it's hard to argue with that, right? And in management, uh, you want to manage this dog? <laughs> you just take him for a walk, right? So if you want to go to a, a barbecue, you want to go to a patio, you want to go to whatever, just when you get out of your car, just make sure, let me get him where you can see me. Just make sure that uh, you, you know, get the appropriate amount of exercise. And with exercise, uh, this guy can very easily, I'm trying to get him posed up here. Get, look here, look at that, look how awesome. But with just the right amount of exercise, guys, management, managing these kind of dogs is super easy. So if you're looking for a dog that doesn't require a tremendous amount of education, right, and has natural genetic tendencies to uh, be just awesome uh, as far as it relates to interacting with people, and has big enough and scary enough to provide a deterrent from criminal elements and other types of uh, uh, evildoers, right, uh, this is it. These are awesome. Good. Okay, let's get another dog. All right, guys, here's a German Shepherd. And uh, it's like, look, I made a video about Silver Labs the other day, and I got a lot of emails and, and a, lot of, a lot of people telling me what I didn't know. Uh, I'm sure if I say anything about a German Shepherd, uh, I'll get quadruple amount that of email. So, uh, but here it goes anyway. All right, German Shepherd started off as an old school herding dog, right? And back in the day when these dogs just kind of popped up on farms, they were awesome. They were so awesome, in fact, that uh, everybody wanted one. 
They're super, what people think of as intelligent, right? In other words, they're very pattern cognizant and they care about what you have to say. So from a dog trainer's point of view, like these dogs are easy to fool with because they have a natural intuitive nature. And so it's, they, 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 they do a good job of figuring out what you want. They're pretty easy to motivate and they recognize patterns quickly. So the total labor investment in teaching the dog like a, a, an obedience routine or a set of behaviors that you'd like to see in your real life doesn't take too much. But let's walk her and let's talk about some things that make, uh, you know, taking them out and doing stuff with them difficult. As I'm walking the dog, um, I want you to kind of notice how she moves, right? And uh, let me get her up here on this, uh, out of these grasses, Eli, and you can see. As I go to get on this board, I want you to watch kind of uh, her rear end. So a lot of these German shepherds, up, 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 they... Like it's a little over angulated here in the back end. And if you can see, like when she walks, you know, like she, her legs kind of go like that, right? And you might say, well, Stoney, that, you know, what's that got to do with training them? Okay, remember guys, when we're taking a dog out into real life situations, we're responsible for making sure that that dog can be successful. So I take this German Shepherd and this dog has a, a race car for a mind, okay? But her body is not exactly a race car anymore. Okay, so when I take this dog out and maybe somebody's, you know, wanting to throw a ball for her, or throw a frisbee for her, or wanting to do something like that, or we're just wanting to go hiking and, and go up and down some, like some steps and, and other stuff, like I've got to be careful because these dogs go through very distinct stages where they're not particularly coordinated, they have a tendency towards uh, musculoskeletal problems, and like, uh, man, every time you turn around, they get what's, uh, uh, they, they get growing pains and they start limping and stuff. So when you're designing your, you know, your dog training protocol, oh, up, up, uh, when you're designing your dog training protocol uh, for a German Shepherd, man, management, that's a big thing, right? Because genetically, like these dogs, their mind, they're right up there to just basically the top of easy dogs to teach, to come, to be still, to have good manners, and to be naturally protective of your home and family. I mean, their minds are, are like razor sharp as it relates to that. Now, sometimes, uh, and I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Sometimes, like some of those qualities have been, uh, you know, exaggerated to the point to where the dogs can be aggravating, right? They're a little barky. Um, a lot of times they, uh, like those old school herding instincts will, will show up in her chasing, uh, like she chases bicycles and skateboards and stuff. And we're trying to work on that. Uh, they're really quick to put somebody over into the, that's a threat category. So like this dog and Chloe, I got three of them here. Uh, if uh, somebody comes up and, and the sun's on the other side of the building and they get silhouetted, they'll circle them and start barking at them. And so there's a lot of things that, that you know, that, that uh, about them that aren't perfect behaviorally. But man, when you get a good one, their mind is rich. It's just about the easiest dog for a dog trainer. Uh, stay there for a second. Now she's not wanting to stay there because of the heat, but we're going to make her anyway. But let's look at that, you know, that totality of stuff I was talking about, where we're trying to take them out into the real world and we need this, this ground covered. Genetics. Okay, so the genetics of this dog, the mental genetics, makes it very easy to take the dog out into real life uh, environments because she's not going to run off from me. Okay, I don't have to worry about that. Uh, she's going to understand like the patterns that on our walk, if we, what streets we stop at, what cafes we stop at, what she's supposed to do if she stays in the truck, where she's supposed to stay when we're at the soccer game, whatever, okay, that's easy. But now the, let me see if I can get her to stand up here, Eli. Uh, getting back to the genetics though, and these, you know, these things kind of starting to, to, to meld together. Like you see this right here, this little extra slope and the way this is, the way your back end's built there. That makes me have to be way careful. Like when I get these dogs at the kennel, you know how I told you I could do a hundred bricks? I can't do a hundred of these because I worry about them all the time. I got to put them up a lot. They, they, they just end up limping a lot. And, and so we got to be super careful with them, okay? So on this thing, right, the genetics, man, they start to give me a good start. But then like when they're going through those uh, big growth spurts, I got to kind of watch. So that's a wash. The education, that's real easy. It's real easy to educate them. And then the management, the management of it, that's kind of your big thing because you have to manage them because as they go through developmental stages we have to make sure that we ask them to do physically appropriate things and we also have to make sure that their tendency towards kind of being guard dogs doesn't get uh, blown out of proportion which is how a lot of them end up having to go to you know see professional dog trainers or um, really how a lot of them end up in the shelter all right let's get a different dog all right guys here's a malinois <laughs> come on and uh, i'm going to get in trouble for this <laughs> but so you go to looking at a malinois 
And, uh, you know, a Malinois is very similar to a German Shepherd. They kind of started off as basically the same kind of dog. Uh, and so what people that have Malinois a lot will say is they're just like a German Shepherd, only better. <laughs> So anything that a German Shepherd does, Malinois does better. They're faster, they're stronger, they're more agile, they do better bite work, uh, <laughs> they live longer, you know, whatever. Now I'm not saying that, okay, because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get assassinated in my sleep, right? I'm just telling you what people that have these dogs say. And uh, hey, listen, you get one of these dogs, if you have enough time to exercise it and you have enough time to, to like, uh, you know, get it out during its early imprinting stages and socialize it and uh, desensitize it to a wide variety of things. Man, they're pretty awesome. You know, they are pretty awesome. But there are some things uh, that make them not quite as awesome as what, what uh, the aficionados, come on, get down from there, what, would have you believe. Okay, so let's get them up here. Now, first thing you'll notice about a Malinois versus a German Shepherd is that, uh, like in the face, a uh, German Shepherd's a little prettier. You know, let's just be honest. Like, uh, everybody, Everybody likes a German Shepherd because the German Shepherd's face is just about the prettiest face in, in, in the dog business, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but let's, let's think about, like, you get the, 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 like, which one looks better out of the way. They're very similar in, in, in what you have to watch out for. So let's, let's take that big block of time where we're having to train them for that first year. Genetics. This dog, man, they just come out looking at you. They, they come out looking at you and saying, hey, what are we going to do next? You know, and, and they'll do it for love. They'll do it for attention. They'll do it for tugs. They'll do it for balls. They'll, they'll do any kind of work for any kind of reason. So people really like them. And that's why, like, look, guys, dog trainers, get around here. Uh, dog trainers, they cheat, right? You know, dog trainers talk about how expert a dog trainer they are. But if you'll notice, Oh, every dog trainer uh, has a kind of dog it's easy to train, right? You know, you'll see me, I have Mr. No Name uh, and uh, Henry, and then I have some Malinois. They're just real easy to fool with, you know? Okay, so uh, teaching these things, they come out genetically predetermined to learn patterns and to work with you. They have high endurance, high energy output. They're agile. They're very strong and physically fit. They last uh, just forever. They just, you know, hardly ever get sick. So that's awesome, you know? So your genetic tendency towards staying with you and doing stuff with you, that's there, right? But now what's the bad thing? They also like to chase stuff. Old school herding dog that's been bred to kind of be a guard dog and protection dog. Every time you look up, you know, Ranger's trying to chase some kid out here on a scooter or a bicycle or whatever. So we got to fool with that. Same thing with that low threshold at which they feel like somebody's here and they're up to no good. So if it's dusk, you know, we have clients coming in late at night. You know, Rangers right there with those German Shepherds. Bar, rah, 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 rah. Now the difference between the Malinois and the German Shepherds, a lot of times the German Shepherds just do the barking and hackling, and uh, the Malinois, they'll circle around there and get them a little nip, you know? So you gotta watch out. When you watch videos about dogs chasing and biting people in suits, don't be surprised if you get one of these little dogs and when you bring them home, uh, they like to chase and bite stuff, okay? So that brings us to the management. Okay, so if the genetics gives me a dog that stays with me, you know, and so here's the whole thing I gotta do. Like in, in a world where there wasn't a lot of other people around, there's not a lot of training with these Malinois. They look at you, they follow you around, they learn patterns very quickly, but the fact that they're a little bit of a guard dog, they're a herding dog, they have a low threshold at which they kind of get uh, a little bit uh, excited and nippy, right? Ah, oh, man, when you go out in public with them, you can have these little dogs where they're perfect off the leash. They come every time you call them. They stay pretty much wherever you put them. You still got to worry about them snapping at somebody. You know, when we get emails, all oh, the thing I made that video about, like, uh, uh, do you want a Malinois or not, or something like that. Like, I go over all the emails that we get where these dogs uh, are, are, are doing things they shouldn't do. Okay, so even though these dogs learn quickly and have a genetic uh, predisposition uh, to stay close to me, right, I had to watch them really close because when they make mistakes, they make the kind of mistakes that people do not forgive very easily. All right, guys, now here we have a Morkshire Terrier, or what people most of the time call a Morkie. And what it is is a cross between a Maltese and a Yorkshire Terrier. <laughs> and listen, these dogs, which believe it or not, Chihuahuas are my favorite dogs, right, of all time, right? It's, it's fun as a dog trainer. When, when, to have a dog that you just realize you can't influence a whole lot, right? You know, I, I mean, I get paid to come down here and kind of boss dogs around all the time. And so I like chihuahuas because you just accept them for who they are. You know, they're not about being bossed. Uh, well, these Morkies, they're kind of similar to that. Like this little dog here. <laughs> Show them, Eli. Uh. 
<laughs> this little dog here is kind of crazy. I mean, you just cannot help but love him. He, he gets down here and he growls at all these. Get on your lap and he growls at all these other dogs. He'll attack them if they bother him. Uh, he shivers all the time. Every time you turn around, he's, he's hiked his leg and he's peeing on something. He'll pee on a piece of furniture. He'll pee on another dog. I, we have these big dogs laying around here and I'll look up and this dog, while they're quiet, because when they're up, he'll kind of be hiding, right? They'll fall asleep. He'll walk right over there and pee right on their face. He, he, I've watched him do it a dozen times. He's crazy, right? So you can't help but love them. And uh, another good thing about them is they kind of have hair instead of fur. And so people with allergies, uh, they do a lot better with these dogs. All right, so let's try to walk him, see what he looks like. Come on, come on, nerd. And you're going to notice that he's, it'll be some semblance of working with me and some semblance of kind of just doing what he wants. But I'm going to pay him pretty lavishly. Oh my gosh, that's very nice. Okay, now we're going to come through here. Come on, we're a little morky. And try to walk him. Oh, nope. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on, come on. Very nice. Now you'll see, like, where, as uh, they say, the herding dogs, they come right with me. This little morky, he kind of keeps trying to dart off and go do his own thing. These dogs, uh, you know, kind of bred to sit on your lap and be the, you know, most important thing in the house. And so when I go to asking them to do something, He's like, dude, you have this wrong. You are a human, and humans are here to serve Morkies. And so that first year with them can be tough. And this guy, he's a little bit older than that. And so we're trying to undo a whole year of him thinking that humans were put on this earth to serve Morky kind. <laughs> Okay, so, but you watch him as he moves, uh, like, he's pretty cool as, as far as, like, he's kind of springy. He's obviously pretty smart. It, pattern cognizant, nah, you know, he doesn't really care about your patterns. He's on his own schedule, you know. But watch him, once I get him going and make him realize that he doesn't have much in the way of options, then he can perform at a really high level. But just getting him started, oh, get up there. Just yes, getting him started on his work can be hard. You know, it's kind of like being a kid in a, in a class that, you know, how many kids you, you grew up with, they were really good at math or really good at English or whatever. They just always put it off to the last minute. You know, they always needed a little extra help. Not because they weren't smart enough or, 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 or capable of doing the work, but just because, come on, come on, they, uh, you know, they operate on their own schedule. Come on, up, 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 up. You can do it. Now, this dog has been up on this table a million times. Now he's acting like he can't do it. Remember what I told you about Morkies? Think humans were put here to serve Morky kind, right? That's this dog. Let me get him up here so Eli can show you what he looks like. Good. Show him what he looks like there, Eli. Kind of about yay big. Uh, this one likes treats a lot. Stay. Okay. What's the odds of him staying there? Zero. Zero. <laughs> hey, you're making me look bad, Yorkie. Uh, now, okay, so... Uh, let's, th let's talk about you know, the big three, right? Like genetics. What's this dog like? Uh, this dog was born to be served. And uh, like no matter how much education you give them, you're never going to convince them that uh, you don't work for them. So that's the first thing, right? Which is cool, you know? Uh, now the second thing is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, education. It's hard to educate something to do exactly what you want when they think that you work for them. <laughs> so like when I tell this dog or show this dog or try to make this dog do these patterns, he looks at me like he's going to take it under advisement. And uh, sometimes he'll do it and sometimes he won't. And I just kind of have to accept that because I can't really boss him. I mean, what am I going to do? You know. Uh, so that brings us to management. All right. So if uh, genetic, so here we are, this is our big, big thing, trying to get a dog to be calm, be still and have good manners, right? If it, genetically, like he's predetermined to do none of that, right? He's predetermined for me to follow him around and, and come when he calls me. Okay. So that makes it tough. Education, it's hard to educate somebody when you can teach them things, but uh, they, you know, they, they only look at it as uh, suggestions, right? So it brings us to management. When you have a little dog that uh, kind of likes to pee on stuff and kind of gets scared of some things and it gets aggressive towards other, you got to manage them very closely, especially when they're teeny tiny, because if he snaps at the wrong dog or pees on the wrong dog or gets scared and darts off into the road, uh, he's too tiny to be able to recover from much in the way of physical trauma, right? So do I like uh, Morkies? Yeah, they're awesome, right? Uh, and if you get to them when they're real young, it's easy to train them to, to it's, it's, re, it's easy to teach them uh, to do things, right? I mean, they learn super quick. Now, uh, is it easy to keep them doing the things that you want them to do over the long haul? Eh, it's a little tougher, 
right? So there's a lot more management. And then remember, like they're little, so if they make a mistake in real life, it, it's, it's a bigger mistake. If, a, if, a, if that dog, he's, he's bad about just snipping at other dogs, if another dog bites him back, well, like look, it's, it's gonna be lights out for him, you know? So. <laughs> okay guys, I got tickled because uh, my buddy Nathan, he's over from Richmond and he's working his dog and he brought his little sister over and uh, so, you know, like a lot of people watch my channel, like when they come down here, it's kind of a big deal. You know, they've been watching my channel. They live over in Oregon or Connecticut or something. They get here and, uh, you know, they know all about me. And so Nathan's little sister came and uh, I said, hey, I'm Stoney. And she's like, uh, who? <laughs> so she didn't know who I was. Anyway, I that made me chuckle. Uh, but so what we're talking about, we talked about uh, the role genetics plays in like trying to figure out how you're going to integrate your dog into high distraction environments. OK, now let's talk about the specifics of our education process. OK, now in the background, you'll see, uh, you know, Nathan walking around. And for those of you that are familiar with my channel, what I'm fixing to go over, it's old hat, but I'm going to go over it anyway. Malone, come on. <clears throat> so now Malone has been here for a few weeks. And we're going to take Malone uh, over to Lexington with us today. And uh, we have to go teach a jiu-jitsu class at lunch. And uh, then there's this awesome semi-industrial area where our jiu-jitsu gym is. And uh, that's kind of when we're getting dogs ready to go home. That's kind of uh, where we start with our testing for high distraction environments. Okay, so, so first things first. If you're going to take your dog out into a high distraction environment, you have to be able to communicate to your dog what's expected. Now, effective communication starts with the development of a common vocabulary. Now, around here, you know, what we do when we get a dog like Malone is we start teaching him a very simple and very basic vocabulary. What we use are these words. Come, let's go, hup, easy, wait, and stay. Come, hey, come to me. Let's go, like let's go for a walk. Hup, it's a catch-all term that we use for negotiating obstacles. Easy, hey, don't knock into stuff. Wait, it's a temporary pause, like somebody's coming down the steps or going up the steps, you need to give them a little space. Stay, hey, stay here, I gotta get something out of the truck. Okay, now you can use whatever words you want, uh, but what you can't do is, <laughs> you can't uh, use whatever type of vocal inflection and posture that you want. In the dog business, lots of people talk about what's the right uh, command. Right? I don't care about the words, but I do care about how you talk to your dog, right? So always make sure, it's like your mom tells you, it's not so much what you say, but it's how you say it. So let's just take a look at my ability to influence uh, Malone with this vocabulary. So I got the one finger rule going. I can walk in with one finger, hup. Easy, watch your feet, wait, temporary pause, easy, and come off there, little jump, little hup. Good, a little big, bigger obstacle, hup, 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 hup. Very nice. Hup, up, 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 easy. Again, wait for a temporary pause. Maybe somebody's walking in front of us. Maybe some kids have, have uh, you know, some mom with a stroller needs to cross the, or get in the elevator first. Who knows? Hup, hup, good, easy, easy. Hup, I'm gonna slow him down. Easy, wait. Now I'm gonna show you. We're gonna go to we're gonna go to the gym and hang out for a little while. And uh, then we're going to take a walk and I'm going to show you all of these commands and how they, you know, how they look in action in the real world. So you want to, dog training basically is based on what they, what people will call progressive mastery, right? So you're sitting at home and you've got your dog and you're in your kitchen. The big mistake is that people are working on their vocabulary, they're working on their motivational base in their kitchen, and then they expect for that to transfer right out to the park. It's not really how it works, guys. You master it in the kitchen, then you got to master it in your front yard, and then you got to master it on your street, and then you master it at the park when there's not very many people there. And you just kind of gradually add layers and levels of distraction, okay? Like you can see in the background where my friend Nathan is walking his dog. <sighs> hey, Nathan, how did that used to go when you tried to walk that dog? He's just chuckling over there. He doesn't even know what to say. Because <laughs> we're fixing to let a dog out here in a second, and you're going to see what Nathan's dog worked, uh, what looked at like three or four weeks ago. And what Nathan would do is he'd get himself caught in this trap of like trying to tell the dog words. He'd be like, uh, off, leave it, you know, whatever words. But he didn't have a motivational base, and he hadn't worked on progressive mastery, right? So he kind of got a little vocabulary work done at his house. And his dog would kind of mind, but then he would try to take it over to college. He goes to EKU, and it would just all fall apart, you know. And so we just took Nathan, we, we backed him up a few steps, and we started teaching him about the concept of uh, advancement based on progressive mastery. And then you've seen him. He's been walking around here behind me this whole time, and he's doing perfectly now. 
All right, so I'm gonna get another dog out real quick before we run to the gym, so you can see kind of where Nathan started. Okay, guys, now let's take a look at a dog that's not ready to go out into a high distraction environment, right? Okay, meet Tasha. She's been here for a couple of days. And you know how I was telling you earlier about we've got those three factors that we have to think about when we're getting ready to take a dog out into real life, right? Genetics, what's the dog's genetic tendencies? Uh, education, you know, what kind of training has the dog has? Is the dog, you know, has, has the dog been subjected to a protocol that brings out the best in their personality? And then the last thing is management, right? So with this dog, this working bloodline German Shepherd at this age, what I'm stuck with is all management, right? Because like, this is her genetics. Right? She sees some stuff that she doesn't like over there in the background and she goes to barking at it, you know? Now, if you have this in a neighborhood, she barks at people and then they get scared and they start looking at her different. It's because of this negative feedback loop, you know? It's very frustrating. Now, believe it or not, on the education side of this, this dog has a, has a pretty big vocabulary. Its owner is a very responsible, forward-thinking person. And he's taught her lots and lots of words, lots of cues. She'll come and she'll sit and lay down and roll over and go to her bed and walk nicely on the leash, but she's only mastered those kinds of things in very low distraction environments. And so even though she has some education, she has some idea as to what I would like for her to do. Like we share somewhat of a common vocabulary, okay? She does not have the ability to put that vocabulary in action because she's not properly socialized and desensitized to this type of environment. And if she can't handle herself in this kind of environment, well then you know for sure you don't want to load her up and take her to an environment uh, you know, of people that aren't dog people, you know, people that are just trying to live their lives. Like, like I said, we're going to the gym. Do you think any of the guys that are taking their lunch break and practicing jujitsu wants to listen to this? No. Do you think any moms at the park who have little kids riding scooters and bicycles want to listen to this? Well, of course not. So until I can get this dog properly socialized and until I can get a, you know, a, a, a given level of mastery uh, uh, of the vocabulary work and her basic manners, I'm not going to put this dog, I'm going to manage her in such a way that I don't put her in situations where she's going to fail, okay? That's what I'm talking about, guys, this complex interplay. Genetics, like what kind of dog do I have? Well, this is the kind of dog that I have, education. I can't educate her today, right? So I can't just work on some stuff today and then take her out in public, right? I have to educate her and then show, slowly, right, work on a concept of progressive mastery. So I'll educate her and I'll master that level of education at a given distraction level. Then and only then will I raise the distraction level to the next level and I will be very calm and very patient and very persistent in the uh, amount of effort that I put into, you know, taking her into a public environment because it's not fair to take a dog that's disruptive uh, into uh, situations where there's, uh, you know, people trying to enjoy their lives. Like you do not want to be one of those dog owners that lets, you know, your desire to have a good time with your dog get in the way of other people having a good time living their lives. All right, we're here at the world famous uh, Four Seasons Mixed Martial Arts Gym. And uh, we're going to work on alone staying still under high levels of environmental distraction. Now he's pretty good. He's hanging out while the guys are practicing throws. Now we don't care where the Malone sits or lays down uh, as long as he stays in this place right here, right? And there's nothing like having a couple of uh, <laughs> half-naked men rolling around on the ground to distract you. <laughs> what do you think, Malone? How are they doing? Dang, very nice. You're a good boy, Malone. You're doing perfect. All right. Now Dylan Perry's arms looking pretty big on this video, dude. <laughs> All right, so we had a perfect session at the gym. Malone could not have been a better gentleman. He was calm, attentive, and polite through, throughout the whole class. And uh, there were 30 people in there, a bunch of half-naked men hooting and hollering and throwing other fellas around and punching, and, you know, just being crazy guys. And Malone was perfect, you know. 
And the great thing about being the perfect dog is you get the perfect amount of attention, right? So Malone sat there and he was calm and patient and we put him in some situations where he was right around the guys, you know, as they were practicing throws and stuff. And, uh, you know, he did, he did great. And everybody was like, oh, wow, Malone is so awesome. And they all wanted to come over there and pet him and touch him. And so our goal is to help Malone understand that he's in charge of what happens to him in life. You know, if he'll be calm, attentive, and polite, then people are going to be really nice to him and he's going to get to do a whole lot of really fun stuff. Okay, that's the essence of positive reinforcement training, guys, is to make your dog understand that how they behave, okay, is what opens up access to all the things that they want. So with it, talk in terms of like the dog mastering those concepts, right? We were down in my kennel and uh, Malone showed me that he had mastered our vocabulary. He come when I call him, he'll be still when I tell him, he has good manners, he's got a good vocabulary and good physical skills as it relates to the exercise with small challenges course. He gets along well with all the other dogs and he gets along well with all the people that come to my kennel. That's our formal work, right? It's inside my fence line. And uh, so then we bring him to the gym and the gym is, a, our gym's a really big gym, but I mean, it's still a controlled environment and he did perfect inside that controlled environment, right? So as a result of doing perfect in the gym, <laughs> then we decided to bring him out here into real life and you just saw that guy yell at us as he went by, right? That's what you see in real life. Show him where we are, Eli. We're in the middle of a big uh, kind of semi-industrial zone, you know, here in Lexington. And this is where we kind of bring our dogs to start to test them, right? There's a lot of coming and going, but all these people are at work. And so like we don't really run into a, a lot of issues where people are like wanting to come up and, and pet Malone. Like people will say hi as they walk by, but when we bring dogs over here, it's not like a bunch of little kids. So, you know, a lot of times we'll go from the kennel to the gym and then from the gym, we'll take a nice leisurely stroll down this industrial area, work on our vocabulary. We'll see some people, see how the dog does. And then if they do well here, we'll go on downtown where there's all kinds of people that are out being leisurely, you know, drinking and taking their kids and playing. That's where the dogs start getting mobbed with attention. So we stair step everything, okay? Now when we come up here, we try to make the dog understand that some of the walk, you know, we got to work on our formal stuff. We got to work, work on calm and let's go, hup, easy, wait and stay. But whenever we get a chance, we always try to move into parts of the environment that are interesting for the dog. Like, if you'll notice, as soon as we came over in this grass, Malone stuck his nose down and started smelling. I'm really big on this, guys. You'll hear it every single video. I'll talk about puppy-sized adventure. To you, this right here, it just looks like a grass field, not interesting at all, right? That's because you can't see everything that Malone sees, because Malone's not looking at everything with his eyes. Malone is looking for stuff with his nose. Come on, Malone. So this is like a 50-50 kind of deal. We come out here and I constantly show Malone. Like in the gym, what was I showing him? If he would be nice, then more people would pay attention to him. Then we come out here for a little stroll and I show him if he'll walk politely with me and he'll do the things that I need him to do in an urban environment, then I'll find a spot in that urban environment where he can explore and he can have a little Malone time. And I make him understand we have some stony time and we have some Malone time. And as long as he understands that the stony time comes first, then like he's going to get to do a whole lot guys you know like he can come over here and investigate and that's perfect I, I really want him to think in terms of every time we go out there's the potential for him to get to do something super interesting and super fun and remember guys you have to let the things be interesting and fun from the dog's perspective you can never lose sight of the fact that like the dog has a different definition of what constitutes adventure and fun than you do. Like see right there where Malone is just smelling? That doesn't look that, that exciting to you and you might be tempted to, to every time your dog stops and smells to interrupt that, right? But for whatever reason, Malone thinks that what he's smelling over there is super interesting. So who am I to get in the way of that, you know? Let him go in there. Now of course I ain't gonna let him go too far, but I know there's a fence back there behind that uh, behind that uh, set of bushes. So I'm not worried too much. It's a big part of uh, like doing in, uh, you know, urban puppy sized adventures is you have to really like think about the environments that you're taking your dog into. And also here in a second, when I bring Malone out of here, I'll show you how to use your environment to your advantage as it relates to, you know, practicing your, uh, your, your, your vocabulary work. Oh, there you are, you didn't even go far. Oh my gosh, very nice. You're a very smart dog. Now, okay, so back up a little bit here, Eli, show them where we are. 
like so just kind of pan her this way and this way all right and then pan back over this way okay so now let's say i wanted to practice a stay here's how i would not practice a stay you stay right there eli so i would not practice a stay in an urban or semi-urban environment not in the beginning like this right so like i want to work on malone's stay but i want to keep him stay stay if I tell him to stay there and he was to break for some reason, which I've mastered my yard work, so he's probably not going to, he could run to the road very easily. You know, how I can take this and work it to my advantage, I just come over here and I position him so that the environment is providing me with a set of boundaries, right? Sit, stay. Now, when you look at this, as you look down, you see just how there's some cars and a dumpster and stuff, and then we have that fence line and that brush back there, and then there's a building over there, right? Basically, there's only one way for Malone to get himself in trouble, and that's right directly through me. So by positioning myself between Malone and the road, right? So I have environmental boundaries on three sides, then the dog, then me, then the road. This is a safe way to practice. Now, what would be a much safer way to practice is with a long line. But since we've spent so much time at my kennel mastering these basic exercises, I feel like I can probably skip the long line a little bit myself. I'm not telling you to, but I can skip the long line a little bit because like, I'm comfortable with the dog paying attention and plus I'm using the environment to my advantage. Oh, you're a good boy, Malone. Oh my gosh. So Malone stays there. He's doing perfect. Now we're gonna come up this way. Now look, we're gonna go from sidewalk to grass. And now we're gonna come over here and walk on some gravel. Again, this is a completely different sensation for the dogs. If you don't believe me, look, take your shoes off. The next time you're around some gravel and take off walking. And guys, if you don't have tough feet like Uncle Stoney, <laughs> you, Eli could never do this, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, but if you don't have tough feet, then uh, that kind of becomes problematic, right? Okay. So be aware of that. You got to be like when you're walking your dog, people like expect their dogs to perform at a high level. And they're trying to sometimes like walk the dog on uh, uh, in the parking lot. Now asphalt gets hot or they'll be trying to, you know, work on something right here and the dog's not moving like it should. Well, I mean, you know, go outside and you walk on that and see how well you walk. So we come over here just gradually, gradually, like making the dog understand that our vocabulary applies across all environments. But I want you to think about this. The dog can know what to do. He can know what's expected. He can understand his vocabulary perfect. He can even be motivated to give me what I'd like to see. But if he's never walked on gravel before, it's going to be super hard for him to perform well, okay? If he's never been in an environment with cars coming by, it's going to be super hard for him to perform well. Like in my gym, if a dog's never been around a lot of people hooting and hollering, it's going to have a hard time performing at a high level. So be understanding. You want to master your vocabulary and master your physical skills, right? And then go, we're going to go this way, Eli. You want to master your vocabulary, master your physical skills, and then gradually expose the dog to higher and higher distraction environments and understand that every time that you change environments, like your mastery is going to go like down a little bit. So you master it at a given level, change environments, there's going to be some catch up time. So dogs can be doing perfect at my kennel. And we bring them over to the gym, sometimes they have a hard time sitting still. And then we might have to do it two, three, four times. Then we don't bring them out here and walk them, uh, you know, in this, in, in this industrial environment until they've mastered being good in the gym. Then we don't take them downtown around all the kids and around all the people that you know, we have a kind of a busy downtown where people like to kind of, you know, knock back some beers and, and eat some burgers and stuff. But you know how people are when, when they're kind of drinking, they get real lovey-dovey on your dog. So if we can't walk a dog over here and have the dog do well, we most certainly don't take them downtown. So it's just graduated mastery. And so Malone like did pretty good on his sit and stay over there in the field with those environmental boundaries. But let's try to do the same thing over here by the road. Right? So, <clears throat> since I don't have any good environmental boundaries when I'm this close to the road, I'm going to always practice this on the leash until the dog has shown me for months that he's 100% reliable. So I come over here and I'm just going to wait, you know, I'm going to kind of wait for some cars to go by and I'm going to wait for some people to come in and out of the buildings and we're just going to practice waiting to cross the road. 
you know. I mean, because ultimately, how can you go wrong with a dog that waits to cross the road? When you're dealing with urban environments, guys, just a lot of things can happen. Squirrels can run out in the road, there can be other dogs, there can be nice people over there talking to the dog, saying he's pretty. There can be kids kicking soccer balls. And I need this dog to be rock solid as it relates to not crossing the road without his handler with him. Let's go. So that went perfect. <clears throat> he did a great job. And then I'm always going to be aware of chances to, you know, use my environment to my advantage. So if you look here, you know, some people have been nice enough to, you know, put out some little cones for me to practice walking in between. Oh, very nice. You a good dog, Malone. We'll walk around these cones a little bit. Good. Then we'll uh, head up and down these stairs. Oh, come on, Malone. And one of the things I really like to practice a lot is as I'm walking downstairs, because you know how like you'll, you'll be on some stairs and maybe some kids will run past you or maybe there's a person that's a little bit, you know, unsteady on their feet. A lot of times it's really important to tell the dog, hey, wait, like just wait a second. Come on, so as we're walking down these steps, I like to go, wait. And I like to have the dog just wait, you know, he just, just kind of chill out for just a second. Let's go. And then we'll head on down here and do a little more exploring. That's perfect. So we've pretty much hit on most of our vocabulary, right? Come, let's go, hop, easy, wait, stay. Uh, and now, we just on the way back to the car, we're just gonna look at some stuff. Like if you'll look over here, this looks like something right out of the Walking Dead. <laughs> we got a chain link fence with some barbed wire on the top. You know, <laughs> hey, if it was dark, me and Eli would show you how to climb that fence, but <laughs> it's daylight and too many people are watching, so. Uh, We'll, we'll save that for a different video. But anyway, we're going to walk. Now, we walked on the sidewalk for a little while. Now, we're going to walk over here in the grass and uh, just do a little bit. Back up there, Eli, show them. Now, you wouldn't think, guys, but walking on the sidewalk is a different experience for the dog than walking on the grass, right? So whenever you get a chance like a, you know, to walk and you have the option to walk on the grass, which I realize you can't always, but choose to walk on the grass. Dogs like the grass. We'll go over here, look at this ash tree. It's a nice tree. We're gonna walk down through here and see what's up. Good. Probably other dogs have peed on this tree. If uh, Malone wants to pee on it, I'll let him. Uh, walk down here and see what's going on back here. Never know. Uh, look here, look at this, Eli. Warning, security cameras in use. You know, and uh, listen guys, you know me, I'm all about the digital age and and uh, uh, about you know cameras and videos and, and different stuff like that. But uh, ultimately, this dependence on security cameras to make everybody uh, act like they've got some sense is misplaced. Because what we're trying to convince people is that you should be good because security cameras are watching you. When what should, we should be trying to convince people of is that they should be good because Jesus is watching them, right? <laughs> That's my little moral thing for today. Don't be good because the security cameras are watching you. Be good because Jesus is watching you. That's what they used to tell me when I was a little kid. And I always thought about it. Every time I was getting ready to do something that I shouldn't do, I would think, maybe nobody's watching me. Not, uh, not, not here, not right now, but Jesus is watching me. And so uh, that, that, that kept me out of a whole lot of trouble when I was young. Okay, and we're just going back. And you'll notice, look, I mean, we've had a super productive walk. It didn't take but a few minutes. You know, and how much did this, you know, how much labor did this really add to my day? Not that much. I put the time in at the kennel to make sure that Malone would, would uh, come, uh, he would walk with me, he would be calm, attentive, and polite, he would stay where I put him, and he had good physical skills so that he could negotiate whatever environment we happened to run into, right? I, I did that work. And uh, then, you know, I started taking him out behind my kennel, out in the woods, out in the creeks, out in stuff like that. And then we kind of rode around uptown and, and in Winchester. And Lexington's a much bigger city. So once he started mastering all that, then, hey, you know, look, we're going to bring him to the gym and see how he does with a lot of guys around. He mastered that. He did perfect today. So then we went on a nice leisurely stroll. And as we went on a stroll, I kept drawing his attention back to the fact that if he would work with me, I would work with him. 
So he came out and he had nice, polite manners. And as a result of him having nice, polite manners, then I let him sniff around and I let him explore and I let him have a good time, okay? So it's a 360 degree win. Everybody wins when you take the time to make your dog come and be still and have good manners from your neighbor's perspective, right? Okay, because when we go out in public, I can't just be saying, I like Malone, he mine's good enough for me. I brought him into a gym with 30 other people that were all over here doing something that they enjoyed, right? And by bringing a well-mannered dog into that environment, I added something to those fellas' day. If I would have brought a misbehaving dog, then I would have taken away something from those uh, fellas' day. And that's not, that's not who you should be with a dog, right? You should help that dog to add joy to your life and to other people's lives. And as a result of him adding joy to people's lives, his life will get better. All right, we're back at the gym. Gonna make the dog sit. Gonna wait here for a second. It's doing perfectly. Come over here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, and so now we're going to go back to the kennel and uh, <laughs> write in uh, this dog's journal that he got an A plus for the day and uh, call his owner and tell him that it's time for him to go home. And Malone's such a good fella, <laughs> he gets uh, convertible rights. Get in there, Malone. Dang. <laughs> uh, Malone's going on a big adventure. All right, Eli, I'll see you back at the kennel.